Thank you for coming this evening. And my name is Tim Marshall, I'm Provost of the New School. And it's my great delight to be able to introduce Tom Main uh, for tonight's lecture. Uh, this lecture was organized by Alexandra Wagner of the Bachelor's Program of the New School for General Studies with the support of the university-wide Urban Committee and the Office of the Provost. It was made possible by the Daisy C. and H. Shapiro Fund, which supports an annual lecture in the field of urban studies and practice. Tonight's talk, entitled Building an Urban Campus, focuses on the project Mr. Main's firm Morphosis designed at 41 Cooper Square for our neighbors and colleague institution, the Cooper Union. Many of the issues and considerations for 41 Cooper Square are ones we share as we consider our own new university center at Fifth Avenue and 13th Street. Cooper Square was conceived to encourage collaboration and cross-disciplinary dialogue to provide teaching and learning spaces as well as a space for exhibitions, public programs, and social exchange, and to be both distinctive and speak to its village address. I am especially pleased to have this opportunity for members of our community to learn from the success of our neighbors project. And indeed, 41 Cooper Square is a critical success. Many of us watched it rise over several years on our way to and from the new school. When it opened in 2009, Ada Louise Huxtable remarked in the Wall Street Journal that it perfectly expresses the creative energy of New York. New York Times architecture critic Nikolai Orosov wrote, it is the kind of serious work that we don't see enough of in New York, a bold architectural statement of genuine civic value. Its lively public spaces reaffirm that enlightenment comes from the free exchange of ideas, not just inward contemplation. Orosov went on to say that the building seems to strike just the right tone for this time in New York's history, a wholly contemporary work. It is bold, aggressive profile. It has a bold, aggressive profile that says as much about the city we've lost as it does about the future we are building. The building was named the best green building project of the year in New York, and it won the 2010 AIA Honor Award in the built architecture category. Many of Morphosis's prior projects have earned similar distinction a collective practice that engages contemporary society and culture through architectural design and education, Morphosis has received 25 Progressive Architecture Awards, over 90 American Institute of Architects Awards, and numerous other honors. The firm's work has been the subject of group and solo exhibitions worldwide. It has drawings, functional objects, furniture, mo and models produced by Morphosis, sorry, models produced by Morphosis are in the permanent collections of institutions, including the Museum of Modern Art New York, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Vienna Museum of Applied Arts, the Israel Museum, and the French Regional Art Collection. Tom Main's career has been very rooted in education, as he was making very clear prior to coming up. The same year he founded Morphosis in 1972, he helped to found, found the Southern Californian Institute of Architecture. He has held teaching positions at Columbia, Yale, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, the Bartlett School of Architecture in London, and many other institutions worldwide. Currently, he teaches at the UCLA School of Arts and Architecture. Among his honors and distinctions are memberships in the National Academy of Design and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Pritzker Architecture Prize, and the Chrysler Design Award of Excellence. So please welcome Tom Main to lecture and to give out tonight's lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Well, it's funny, I've, I've, uh, I loaded up a lecture here that was set up for something a little differently. And if I, it was this intimate of a crowd, I would have restructured it a bit. But um, let's see where we can go. I understand your, the discussion had to do with your building a new project, and there was a, a relationship between your goals and ambitions, et cetera. Um, and I'm going to show three projects, and they're, they're essentially um, campus or academic projects, and try to make very kind of specific um, relationships to um, your potential project. Um, but I'm going to set it up really as a um, kind of introduction for a conversation, because I'm going to try to get through it in maybe 45 minutes, because I, I understood that really what we wanted to have was a, really a conversation that has to do with um, the potentials that take place within um, your future. Um, before I start that, um, I, I think that it would be useful to discuss um, the foundational material, the broader conceptual um, uh, intellectual um, foundations of the work and um, that have to do with, um, hmm, I wouldn't say theory, I think that's a, that's a really kind of overused and inappropriate 
term. I think it, it has more to do with preoccupations and interests and um, uh, aspects of one's research that um, is, is the, uh, the basis, the DNA material of the work. Um, from very, <clears throat> from just about the beginning of my work, I've been fascinated um, with an architecture of relationships, that it's, um, it's about a conversation, a dialogue. Um, from the very early projects, it was a critique of the object and the singularity of the object and um, the singularity in terms of its position urbanistically and the singularity in terms of its position of its authorship. The, um, with that um, has been a, um, a preoccupation with a very particular type of complexity. Um, not complexity for its own sake, but complexity as it, re as it relates to the reality of our existence. And that focus has um, found its way into the organizational aspect of the work, because I think primarily what we're really interested in, in is um, ordering human activity. And it will be very specific to the problems we're going to talk about today. And it's about the rethinking of um, coherency, because essentially what we do as architects is we give things order. We make them coherent. And the, really the discussion um, is the nature of coherency and the, um, the definition of what that is. And there's a very, um, there's a disagreement in terms of, uh, of, of that kind of subject as there is, say, today in our political world, where there's an absolute um, kind of radical differential between uh, the nature of um, the conversation of a, of a dem of democratic society, et cetera, et cetera, and what that means. Um, I guess it's obvious that there's been certain uh, perceptions of that coherency because it's a coherency of, uh, of incompleteness. Um, it's a coherency that represents the conflict and the disruptions and the distortions that have to do with a day-to-day -day life. Um, and it has to do with the, um, the mining of those interferences and the use of uh, everything idiosyncratic and specific. And in that sense, it's been a critique of the generic. And um, again, I entered architecture in the late 60s, early 70s, and the, um, probably the singular text was Complexity and Contradiction with Venturi. And it was, of course, at the time of the exhaustion of modern, the modern project and the, the beginning of a new thinking that had to do with, a, um, I think, a much more nuanced idea of um, the relationship, the hybridity, the, um, the complexity of, um, of architecture as response to the, uh, the enormous amount of forces that produce it. Um, the process um, is reiterative, um, semi, um, I'm not, I forgot, I've got kind of what, half architects and half others here or something like that. Uh, can I, uh, I've been interested in, um, in, in, uh, in ideas of randomness and, um, but it, it, the, the space is somewhere between randomness and a more conventional organization. And um, the work is highly um, located within methodology. And the work is a, is a product of that methodology. And it's attacking a prioriness. And the, 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 the person would be Louis Kahn in my mind. Um, the notion was you think, you, you, uh, you conceive something and you draw it, you represent it and it moves through that process. And I'm interested in something um, quite different than that. You work with an operational strategy. It would start maybe closer to Jackson Pollock. And out of that process, um, you develop an organizational idea, a structural idea, structural in terms of organization. And um, space comes out of that. It's not preconceived. It doesn't come out of a historical position, right? An a priori position, again, it comes out of an invention that is directly connected to that process. And all of it leans on um, Popper's false solution. You put down a, a initiating idea and you now um, challenge that. You, um, uh, you interrogate, um, it's a critique of that. And the critique is, um, if it's working, it has to be ruthless. It has to be absolutely, completely um, um, open to all possibilities in terms of the, um, the movement of that idea as it um, withstands various um, 
uh, particular uh, <clears throat> the elements that, that that you're trying to resolve, you're 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 operating and critiquing based on those on those set of operations. Um, because of that, it, it's a, it's an evolutionary process. It's evolving, right? Because that notion means that you're putting an idea down and it's it's moving through that process, and um, one hmm, one comes to a completion as you've uh, you've uh, become aware that you've exhausted the idea, right? And then finally, um, I have to say, um, I personally am a magpie. I um, I am an appropriator. Uh, architecture is a uh, is a language, and as a language, it's um, it's appropriated. And um, I observe. I try to stay alert. I take from everybody. I steal anything I see in front of me. And um, really, what I think architecture is is the the notion of interpretation, of kind of how one uses that material, and um, what is yours in quotes, um, what becomes. Um, hmm, what becomes a part of, a, 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 let's say, a language or a connective tissue that's connected to your studio, your, your um, collective effort, is in fact the nature of that interpretive act, the nature of how you transform that and how you move that forward somehow. Mm, forget the forward, how you just move that, whether it's forward or backward is a much more complicated question. And then there's, to end this, um, the, this notion of, um, of uh, interpretation is um, definitely um, focused on innovation. And I think this is one of the keys, um, certainly will be for your project, because I think today um, the discussion is going to be enhancement versus status. And for me, that would be the singular idea. Um, I think especially with the academic environments, and even more so with the more uh, kind of, let's say, established um, East Coast environments, the Harvards, the Yales, the Princetons, et cetera, um, that I would say that their, um, their focus is um, somewhat backward, somewhat history-laden, and is based on status. And I would say that the most important thing in especially building work for um, the academic environment, which is gonna be nothing more than representing um, the notion of um, of uh, inquisitiveness, of demanding uh, a notion of a building that participates with the young people, which are at a point of their life that are they're asking questions, that it participates that, and it enhances their intellectual, their emotional life, and it 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 it, it adds to that. It's, it's a it uses architecture as a method of seeing and observing the world, and, and it is participatory in the educational act. And I think that would be the absolute key to any beginning of a project. And then um, with that. I think the, the, the discussion of, um, hmm, we're in a time where architects that are producing innovative work, or they're challenging status quo, let's say, um, that it seems to be the discussion has been radical conservative, or, that, that, or, or there's an aggressiveness seen to the research that's leading to the questioning of status quo. And I think it's a um, really, really out of date kind of idea. The notion of looking at architects as kind of radical architects on one side and more conventional architects on the other. It's an absolutely meaningless conversation. It's, it's, it's got to be 50, 50 years, five decades out of date. And the discussion should really be um, the, the relationship of the formal as it relates to the performative. And performative in the broadest sense of the word. Performative in terms of environmental, its relationship to landscape, its relation to urbanism, its relation to modern technologies, to the social, to the cultural, um, to the political meaning of a building. And really, the discussion has to be within broad, integrative terms that architecture is the capacity of, um, it essentially concretizes our world. And uh, it, it's, it's a, um, it's, its relationship to that world is, is, the, uh, is the basis of its, of its formation. If I'm a little jerky, I'm, I was up quite early this morning in, in Paris, and I'm a, I'm a little bit tired. I should have gotten one more coffee of <laughs> Alexander. Um, okay, I'm gonna start three projects, and then I'm working some other projects that, that kind of allow you to understand the, the, the connection of these, because I've been working for 35 years now, and, and it's a, everything is connected to everything else in some way, so I've, I'm trying to just uh, make a series of connections that allow you to understand the nature of, of how we've um, of, uh, interpreted the, the, 
the things I'm talking about. And um, it's going to end with the Cooper building. And if, if, if it's done correctly, it should be fairly obvious that the Cooper will be able to say just about nothing. It'll make sense. Um, uh, seven years, eight years ago, we were we won a competition to, to rework um, uh, a major uh, piece of the, the University of Cincinnati, um, and the whoop. there we go. Um, we're um, gonna, this is the this is the, the campus essentially, and there's the medical campus at the upper upper right, and um, we're going to take kind of this this place right here, and. Um, we're going we're gonna to do this. And it was a really interesting project. And that um, uh, the University of Cincinnati, under the, the, under the guidance of, of, the, of the beginning of the, with the dean and the president, had decided to use architecture and, uh, as, and architecture symbolically to um, kind of ramp up the status of the campus. And it was kind of a weird idea that not bringing in other programs, not bringing in um, more. Uh, Renowned professors, etc. They were actually going to do it through the the the, uh, the infrastructure, the, the physical nature of the campus, and they were they brought in um, Peter Eisman to begin with, which was a definitely was a, a got them going in a, in a particular direction, and then after that a series of people, and they were building um, uh, quote icons, they were building buildings of, um, of, of 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 some sort of a status, and um, towards the end of a, a two billion dollar capital campaign program when they came to us, um, they had revised their thinking, and they became interested in building um, something more infrastructural and about a connective tissue of a campus, and not singular. And this is this, this place, and you're going to see we have this kind of piece in here that's connected to the, and it's to the, to the football field, and it's going to be about literally the connection and the, the social and, and um, uh, uh, educational connection of the campus. And um, it was absolutely, uh, uh, the, the, it was, hmm, like many campuses, it was fairly ad hoc. And it had grown accretionally over over um, 80 years, and they were now restructuring that and giving it a coherence. And um, it kind of operated. This is the existing stuff. And um, if I had time, I would tell you that in these complex projects, we have uh, a series of operations work work off of multiple systems. And um, I've been fascinated with the idea of organizations again is not singular but multiple. And um, projects at this scale require um, that type of thinking. And so here we are, and we're going to be connecting the, the, the old, the original campus, the square, with the um, the new part of the campus. And it's going to be a um, um, a street, and it could be San Gimignano, and it's moving towards kind of the, one of the first buildings, uh, the, the the student the student union, and um, it's going to become a street and a connected tissue. And all of it is going to be um, promoting transparency, connectivity, um, the social structure, and it's um, I think what's of course, common today, and I think just about all educational um, kind of thinking, is that uh, education is seen as a um, uh, within social cultural terms, and the relationship of um, of transparency and the interconnection of student, 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 faculty, etc., is is seen as kind of key to the, the development of the organizational ideas of the building. And what you're looking at here is a urban compound, and everything is connected to um, social space and learning space. And at the same time, um, we're interested in strategies that allow us to have huge differentiation, um, challenging the singularity of architecture. And as you move through this, the spatial types and the conditions change like they would in a um, in historical city. And the um, the interior um, is a reflection of that. This was a let me go back. This is a really interesting one I didn't show. Um, and again. Uh, Maybe this is an opportunity you have. Um, there was uh, uh, academic space. Can you see the? Yeah, okay. Um, um, academic space that was at the edge of this movement path. Um, there was housing. Um, huge discussion that came in much later in the project, bringing in housing into the campus. It was uh, isolated, like a huge amount of large campuses are. And it, uh, it was brought into the campus. And then um, the large the, uh, uh, gym facility, the athletic facility, and then on one edge, blow that the main eating facility of the campus, et cetera. And um, so it brought in basically five programs. It was academic, housing, the main um, food facility, the main athletic facility, and in, in, infrastructural hub. And again, I think in a, in a city that would even be more interesting. And then again, an interior, which is all based on the forces of the site. There was no, um, the site itself shaped the building. 
So it's a kind of really kind of unusual kind of opportunity. It's not the, you're not conceiving of a, of a thing in any object form. It's literally the forces of the site um, and the interpretation of those forces produce this uh, enormous space. And again, everything's connected. You're looking at part of the, 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 uh, the main food court that's looking into the, the gymnasium, and all of these pieces are connected. All of them promote kind of a radical transparency. Um, I don't know why I showed this. It'll have nothing to do with an urban campus, but I had to show it because I'm building it right now. And it's, it's, it, there's certain ideas that definitely in the interior would, 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 are going to creep in. Um, you'll see it, and it's for sure in Cooper. Um, we're working on a large campus for a pharmaceutical group in, in Shanghai, and um, it would be the absolute antithesis to, to Manhattan in that we're, um, we're building an augmented landscape, and uh, we're building something that um, is, is, gonna, is gonna occup that the, the, the land occupies 83% of the total site, and if you're looking at um, a photosynthesis or a carbon dioxide cycle, it's gonna maximize that. And then I'm gonna show you this because this is gonna be um, very much kind of how we think about our work in terms of process. So we're looking at multiple systems, and I can, I can understand and look at each of these systems and how it behaves. This is a the landscape system. It'll be operating on a global level. There's an administrative piece. And again, I can, I can look at that. I can make ev evaluations, and I can take each of these systems and describe them and understand them as they, um, as they operate under multiple demands, multiple performances. <coughs> and out of that um, comes the uh, complexity of a plan. This is um, over 300 meters long, and um, spaces that become auditoriums and libraries and athletic parts and housing facilities and um, administrative wings etc., and develop a very um, kind of organic idea of, a, um, of an organization which um, moves from the mechanical to the biological. It's um, no place is a repetitive, and yet it's clearly organized, it's coherent, you can understand it, right? And I'm interested in that, that dynamic idea. And um, here it is about six months ago under construction, and again. And again, uh, as you look at this, every piece will be unique um, to the, the specifics of both of its demands uh, from an interior sense and from a site sense. Fairly recently, as you're looking at that bit, large landscape mass. And an interior that is, again, going to use the layering and the relationships between these different systems that makes up um, the um, multiple use types of the building. Um, piece of the library, looking out of a reading room in that same space. These structural pods, which are also mechanical and uh, produce um, heat and cool air. And a part of the rec facility, this is a uh, aqua aquatic, I uh, lost my, this is all gonna be, this is all gonna be filled with water. And out here is a landscape, and again, there's this continual relationship between landscape and exterior, interior. Okay, second building, Kale. Um, we um, received this project about four years ago, and it's the, um, the Astrophysics Center for Caltech, and it was an absolutely fascinating project. Um, like uh, Cooper, in some degree, um, the client was extremely horizontal in that it was a, a collegial environment, so we had a fairly large client. Um, they're, ast they're astrophysicists and mathematicians. Uh, nine of them are, are Nobel people. Um, it's absolutely kind of fascinating uh, project type. Extremely simple problem. It was given to us as a, um, because of the economics of the project, as more or less a um, orthogonal um, three-story building with a singular basement, and it came to us that way for zoning reasons. It absolutely, totally parallel to, to Cooper. Cooper, we had nothing to do with the shape, but the size of the building. Um, and uh, we um, got to operate on that kind of condition. And what came out of um, our discussions with the client um, was the notion of a building that's responding to um, particle physics, the force lines in atomic structure that are, that's breaking in a um, 
in a consist in a consistent way this um, this original Cartesian orthogonal piece, and it's allowing us to express a dynamicism, which in, um, is in some ways um, parallel or is uh, associated to um, to their own investigations. But by the way, um, uh, I think when um, there's a lot of discussion about the the use the literal use of of ideas that go from one subject to another, and, and there's, it's not literal in a building. I make no claim that this has anything to do with particle physics. It's an operational strategy that takes you someplace, right? That deals with um, arbitrariness, all right? So finally, it, it's, um, it becomes something else in this notion of uh, the, the breaking, uh, the, these, these force lines become an initiating act that are quite different than the thing itself, right? That, that, to, to see them as literal would be, would be really um, a mistake. And yes, you can, you can make them literal, but finally the building becomes, the, the thing itself is, is something much more complicated and in its translation to, to something physical um, has its own kind of essences. And then um, again, this building um, very much started establishing kind of directions of the Cooper Union because it was developing from the inside out and the inside was a connective tissue uh, that, that had to do with the, um, the connection of the various departments and, and then again the social cultural connection of the people that operate on it and, and, and the outside forces of, um, of the urban. Because again, the outside came very much from um, the material is terracotta-like and it was um, making direct reference to the very um, traditional Pasadena uh, environment and was, <clears throat> was, was part of the urban act in the interior was a very, very different interpretation of these force lines, which now allowed us to produce something um, quite unique um, as we produced the four-story space that connected the lower floor to the, to the upper floor and became a, um, an initiator to develop something that was um, specific and unique to this particular enterprise. <clears throat> Photographs are... Um, Kind of complicated of seeing architecture because this requires movement. And if you'd looked at this, uh, I don't know if this, I can't only see it in my eyes, if this looks like something ordered or I'm not sure what it looks like to your eyes, but it's an absolutely um, ordered system that operates within um, a series of rules that we can articulate and is in no way um, pictorial or arbitrary in that sense. Um, I'm operating on a system and you're looking at the result of that system. I'm not drawing something. No one is actually drawing this in terms of composition, which is another discussion which is going to end in Cooper. Um, I think the idea of composition is kind of over. I think especially with the, the last, say, decade um, having to do with the, the digital environment and the, uh, the kind of the end of, I think, the mechanical and the movement towards the biological in terms of the, the system of organizing, um, that um, the, the relationship now is, is much more a relational, the, 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 the work now is much more a relational world than it is a, a, a compositional world. And again, um, like the urban work, um, the interest is producing something of um, kind of ultimate differentiation. There's no place that's similar to another place, and yet it's seen as a singular environment. And as you move in different scales, you keep finding more information. And then again, um, that space um, was very much connected to the broad idea of these exterior, interior forces that had very much to do with our courthouse, um, where the, the, the connective tissue of the exterior and the iconographic piece of the court was very much uh, formed by an idea of the interior, in this case, uh, a very different kind of direction having to do with a broad connective tissue which had to do with the interpretation of, uh, of the Constitution of the Bill of Rights as an open-ended document, which was a huge conversation with my, my very conservative uh, Chief Justice, and that um, this relationship is part of the connection of the courts, um, which finally um, finds its way into the court itself. And as you understand the court as the, uh, as the uh, um, the, the, the language of the court, you understand the connective tissue, the, the, the connection between the court itself and the relationship of the court and the, the, the symbolic relationship of the court makes up the, um, the DNA matter of, of the, the collective piece. And then um, I'm going to end with Cooper, but um, 
I'm going to remind you now that um, this work, of course, is uh, a reflection of multiple forces. And it's going to talk about, of course, the, the, the functionalities of the institution, in this case, uh, um, art, architecture, and engineering. It's going to talk a response to the environment um, in terms of its uh, performance. It's going to talk about its relationship to its urban environment. And um, it's going to talk about its social structure. And uh, I want to just remind you really quickly, because um, it's going to come directly from um, investigations we've been, we've been making over the last uh, 10 years um, in, say, with perform high-performance skins, started with, um, with uh, the, the, the Caltrans building in Los Angeles. And we're going to be talking about a building that not only produces public space and then does it with multiple skins, et cetera, but those skins are going to be high performance. And they're going to be differentiated uh, in terms of their direction. This is a, a Brisolet a photovoltaic that's producing um, energy for the building. The other ones are taking out light from east and west. And then we really pushed that in San Francisco, where um, we were able to reshape the building, a very narrow building of 15 meters, where now we could remove air conditioning, we could remove um, uh, most of the lighting, and really, really push the notion of performance environmentally, and it had a huge effect on our future work. And of course, um, with that came its stance towards urbanism. It came its stance in terms of its, um, its iconic graphic position in San Francisco with its roof. It came with a social structure, a park in the upper levels, and a large kind of public space and daycare center, which were all part of the social order, which was very much connected to the San Francisco environment. And then, of course, the opening of the, uh, of the, of the court, probably the most important building in San Francisco, the, the um, uh, Seventh Cir Circuit Court of Appeals. And um, again, that public space is it tears out of the, out of the, out of the, out of the, uh, the skin. And, and the entry piece, which is this very kind of formal, um, WPA-ish, just about kind of entry piece representing the, the United States of America. And again, at this point, we're working totally integratively in terms of um, structure, mechanics, functionalities, um, its urban approach, the material response, et cetera, is all taking place through um, automated models. And again, um, the, the space of this entry, which is the, um, the structure of the skin, which is the basis of the building environmentally, and then with that, uh, the social order of the skip stop or express elevators, and you're moving from every three floors, one up, one down, and those are secondary social spaces, meeting spaces. And um, we really spent a lot of time with this client discussing um, the work environment, which is no longer connected to the specificity of a singular place. But today, um, and again, it's going to show up in, in Cooper, um, Starbucks, I was there having a coffee about an hour and a half ago on my way here. Um, as you know, everybody plugs in, and it's in fact as vital a work environment as a, um, the formality of, 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 an urb, of, a, uh, of, of, of an academic space that's been developed in academic space. And there's been a complete merging or, or hybridization of the relationship of, of work, work environments. And we're working with that idea. And here are these secondary spaces, a tea room, coffee room, conference rooms, uh, the spaces that you saw coming out of the building in the plaza uh, stairs become kind of secondary meeting places. You're literally floating over the public space. You're in the city itself. And then the operational skin, which is now um, <clears throat> highly performative. <clears throat> and the north side, which guides in wind, which is a thick skin. And the interior, as you're looking out of that skin and you're looking at the ceiling that's guiding air through the building. And out of that, we, were, um, we literally took out the air conditioning um, it's naturally ventilated, first large building in the United States. And the, um, well, I said we took out the air conditioning. Over here, I will tell you, we said we replaced it with the skin. And so we took the 14 uh, million um, in this and put it into that. And then, of course, the result of that was enormous. Um, the relationship of, of a normal building, a Title 24 building, and ours in terms of energy use, and that converts into this. So one building produces enough energy, the delta, to, to power 600 homes. And again, that maybe doesn't sound like an enormous amount, but 10 of these are, are, are um, 6,000, and 6,000 is a community of, of 20,000. Mm -hmm. It's significant, right? And, and again, I think um, I'm showing you this because by the time you get to Cooper and a lot of our recent work, and then again, the airflow, um, it becomes a, um, an obligation because now it becomes a, a political or what an ethical kind of discussion in terms of your, your stance towards this particular issue. And again, um, something as simple as just pulling air through is actually an incredibly complicated problem. Uh, two years with Overup and um, uh, Berkeley um, um, Lawrence Labs 
and um, incredibly specific in terms of the, the movement through servo motors and it's uh, the, to keep the air temperature at a, at a, at a um, within the human range, which is uh, 70 degrees or something. And then again, a building that pushes this again, that's now even shaping the building, a building we're just starting construction with at Far Tower, big, big building, the tallest building in Paris, two million square feet. And um, the, the, it's again going to be a complex of buildings, um, not a singular building, and it's going to be very much formed on this very, very odd non-site. People moving out, a uh, half a million people come in, uh, the, the, um, the Metro stop, um, 20,000 come into this building. And now um, uh, the shape of the building, uh, again, this LA that goes through the um, University at uh, Copavois, and uh, you're moving up to the to the um, 30 meter, 110 foot level, and enter this large space of the, where the skin delaminates from the body of 20 stories um, as an entry point, and it's all part of an urban kind of entrance from the subway. And then again, here's that here's that space, and um, and then this building, which is formed through its response to the sun. But again, as an urban idea, it's seen as um, highly differentiated based on where you're viewing this project from the city. And again, um, the, 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 the dynamic response of, um, of solar, and now um, an ability to develop an immensely precise um, uh, skin or envelope having to do with a highly differentiated form. And we're now looking at um, rationalizing that into a series of families. And uh, there's 5,500 individual pieces and, uh, and, and the prototype of that skin. And now um, we're scripting the, the skin. And if you look at this, each one of those panels uh, has a date on it and it tells us when it's operating in a maximal capacity. And we're now able to deal with an incredibly accuracy, um, the performative aspects that have to do with environment. Okay. Um, Cooper is, um, it's just a reflection of everything I'm talking about. Because again, we're going to talk about it in environmental terms, we're going to talk about it in terms of the, the social program, and, and it's going to reflect its urban environment. And um, as I mentioned, um, it's actually an incredibly simple building. Um, that's the, the program. And the envelope, um, can I draw, I can't draw on this. The envelope was a given, it was that. And uh, when we arrived, the, the program had been completed and the, the planning the planning process had been completed. And as we won the selection, we were given that as a, um, uh, as a, uh, the, the limitations. But really, of course, what um, becomes the interest had to do with the connective tissue. And again, um, it might seem strange to you, like Cincinnati, same problem. Cincinnati, large-scale urban problem, horizontal, right? Um, this one, um, connective tissue, three schools, vertical, uh, a vertical uh, connective tissue, vertical plaza instead of a horizontal one. And then within that, um, the systems of movement and um, the connection around that, and that becomes the, the problem. This is more or less given, right? So it's really, really just about kind of it departs from that, that piece. Great location in New York, as you know, a small block, kind of one of the few, the block and the building are coterminous. And um, part of the, um, kind of the original city, it still has the grittiness and the reality of, of Manhattan. Um, and of course, it's connected to Cooper Union. And um, so from the beginning, we were fascinated with um, an opportunity for, um, the words we use, the idiosyncratic, the specific, et cetera, is seen to be the, the perfect vehicle for that. And um, again, that might be a conversation you'd be interested in having, because I would suggest that when you're starting your building, that um, it seems like, uh, particularly in this neighborhood, um, in New York, um, you have the opportunity to produce something that's highly specific and highly personal to this institution and to, the, um, to that definition of this place, and this um, challenges the, um, or certainly is very differentiated from the uh, corporateness of a Seventh Avenue or a Fifth Avenue or a Park Avenue or whatever, right? And it's funny as I've, I've walked quite a few groups of the building now. I really enjoy the, the Museum of Modern Art types 
because I started to anticipate the, the characters. And um, there's going to be a group of, of people from the city that are going to be um, Seagram's people, right? Beautiful materials, highly articulate, classical, et cetera. And um, they're going to be more the East Villagers, the grittier ones that like the New York of the, the, this other kind of reality. Um, and um, it's going to be anticipatable. I'm going to say also that I think that um, as, as I show you these images, I think there's, uh, and I've, it's become much clearer to me as I've, I've, I've walked people through, um, there's two ways of seeing this building. Um, one is that, and it was mentioned that Ada Louise talked about it. Um, she's great, by the way. She's one of the only writers that doesn't talk to architects before she writes articles. I was with her the other day, and I was, I was kidding her about it because so many people call you today and ask you to explain the building, and she wouldn't think of doing that. She would find it actually kind of preposterous. Um, but uh, uh, she sees it as a very conventional building, that it responds very specifically to its urban events, and I would would agree with that. Um, if you look through the lens of language, you're going to see it as a as a as an object that's quite differentiated, and you're going to see it as something different, right? And it depends which lens you want to see it through. Whether you see it through a more basic notion of the the, the structure of the building, or whether you see it through only its visual, the physiognomic. And um, Again, incredibly simple. Um, it starts in, in, an, in its most normative state as an orthogonal thing, and it moves um, to its more dynamic state as it moves towards um, Cooper Union and towards entry and towards the, the priority of, of uh, the movement, et cetera. And um, it, it's bending, and it's bending in as the force of the, of the landscape of the trees. And it was very important to me that it, it, it moved in um, versus out, and that it's a uh, kind of a receiver Right of the force of the, of the landscape as it pushes through, and it's a. Um, hmm. I think it's important that emotionally it's a. Um, it, it's instead of being instead of moving the other direction where it's moving out to you and being much more aggressive, it's accepting the force of the city as it moves through, and then and the bending um, was just a method of allowing it to have, um, the discussing the relationship of ground to sky, and to um, again produce. A dynamic notion, and then the, the middle piece that comes out is the um, is the, the social element. It's the it's the uh, the energy of the of the of the of the open spaces of the movement spaces, and again in this case it was just an obvious opportunity that you're using the intellectual creative capital of the institution and putting it back on the street. And New York is nothing but an intensification of that type of energy, and um, but it also um, uh, what the facades have done. Um, they're, they're not only producing highly efficient, or they're participating in producing um, efficient buildings and taking out 50% of uh, social energy, but they're allowing me to um, um, to rethink how I want to express the building. I'm no longer interested in solid void, window solid, which is a, is a 3,000 year old kind of notion of what architecture is. I can now choose uh, and, and what I want to document in terms of the um, the reading of the building, and I can suppress the stuff I don't want to see, in this case, offices, secondary spaces, et cetera. And it allows me kind of huge opportunity to um, kind of rethink the nature of the, um, the expression of a building to its public. And again, um, trying to some way destroy the original envelope that we were burdened with, right, and, and, and make it useful, because that the, 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 the breakdown of the space that came to us from the city was not something we would have chosen, but we now use that as part of the program, and in this case, the large outdoor social space, and um, and then the feet, the way it touches the ground, and, and um, we were really, really interested in the notion of um, the multiple reading of the object, solid void, uh, solid transparent, and the dynamicism over various times of the day, and the relationship of the street is the most dynamic kind of portion of the building, and as it touches the street, it expresses a dynamicism. Each of those are a different they're, 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 they're a different geometry. And um, all of them express um, the tension, um, the dynamicism of, of, the, of that environment. And again, um, this little bitty, this little piece of space we push back to make room for the public, because there was no opportunity. If um, given all opportunities, that would have all been empty. But we had every square footage we had to use. In fact, it was interesting. I'm not sure how far you're along. But um, when you have different groups working, the group programming, of course, never talked to the 
another architect that was doing the, the zoning envelope. And of course, when we got there, there was 40,000 square feet missing. So from the very beginning, we didn't have enough space, and it became a major part of the problem. And um, again, the kind of the multiple readings of this thing as you're reading through the public space. And again, um, there was a huge amount of discussion that came from um, the local um, neighborhood group having to do with the openness of the lower floor. And if you've seen the building, you know you can see all the way through and um, to the Ukrainian church. Um, when I first presented this, it was pretty hilarious because the, uh, the, the group was extremely angry with Cooper Union. Uh, having to do with the Charlie Guathamy site, and that apparently it kind of crept in without anybody knowing it. And it wasn't the design; it was the it was the, the scale. And uh, so we had a very very contentious group for quite a while, and and had to solve this. But the the notion at the bottom is it's all kind of empty and open to the street and the neighborhood. And again, um, the scan is dynamic; it opens and closes, and it does two things: it opens and closes for environmentally, eh, secondary. Um, but it, it allows uh, the user to control his own environment. And um, a lot of this had to do with just opening a clear view versus the, the screen. In the end, it seems to be not that important. The screen is extremely uh, non evasive, let's say. But the more important thing is that you still have, you, you, this, the, the user has control and can operate um, the system at a, at a personal level. And then, of course, the, the real kind of singular most kind of interesting aspect of the building, which had to do with the, um, the, the connections of, um, of people vertically. And um, the, the very first ideas had to do with this fluid space that moves 11 floors from the top to the lower two um, subterranean levels. And um, there was a huge amount of, we, we spent about a year working on this, and it went through um, uh, a number of reiterations, actually dozens of reiterations, and the discussion was to form something that was uh, coherent as a space that was structured, but at the same time it had to be transparent. And we went back and forth, and this one we were, we were still very, very solid, it was not going to work for us because it didn't allow for the type of connections one needed. And um, it was moving more and more to something transparent as it moved in this direction, and then as it was built. Um, two different organizations, the, the opening and a, and a stair that's going to move up four floors and this fluid volume that's going to come down that's going to move you um, in the vertical direction and the intersection of that. And again, from the entry and the, um, the, the entry desk looking out to the street. And um, uh, we had to clear the corner. Um, there's a stair in the corner and that's, it's, a fire, it's a fire stair, but we're just using it as part of the dynamicism of the building and opening up this critical part of the building where everything wants to be, and then the stair. And of course, the stair is a social space, because the stair was, was always thought about as both its functional terms, and again, um, when we're talking about environment, we're talking about health. Um, uh, three quarters of the, the building, you could walk, right? You don't use lifts. And, um, but it's, of course, the main social space, and it's parallel to the Met, or the, the, the um, New York Library, et cetera. And, um, if you've been in the building, you realize how different it is having to do with the various times you're in the building, and sometimes it's absolutely packed. And um, and we, we literally saw the human characters, just about a building material, and it was, it was absolutely elemental that it was filled. And then again, um, this notion of something that's highly idiosyncratic and highly differentiated, so as you move through it, you're constantly seeing things in different terms. And um, And then as you look up, the connection to the light, the skylight, and um, you're looking at four stairs, each of them differentiated, each of them generating from the diagrid, right? So there's an absolute, the, di the diagrid is the general material of the stair, the geometry of the stair, and of course they are all op operating as lanterns, as lights. And, um, and again, like Caltech, um, could be seen in very different modes having to do with the scale, et cetera. And then looking down through the space and through that window you're looking at to the park in front of Cooper Union. And the whole thing, of course, was related to the foundation building. And um, by the way, there was a huge discussion about um, history and uh, the relationship of this building historically to the foundation building. There was a, a divide within the board of directors. And um, what uh, finally we reminded everybody of, and there was an agreement, is that the, um, the foundation building is really fascinating. It was the tallest building in New York in 1850, first building with an elevator. So actually, it was an immensely innovative building. And you've got to remember, you have to put it in context in 150 years, and you realize that you're still talking about innovation and the notion of um, 
any type of, um, of uh, mimicry or uh, identification in a literal sense is absolutely preposterous. Absolutely preposterous. The distance of what's taken place in architecture, conceptually, technologically, ecologically, urbanistically, on and on, right? In 150 years, of course, is monstrous. And again, um, these secondary spaces like San Francisco, there's a, a, a fifth and an eighth floor. So if you've been there, there's really, mm, we couldn't get them to quite do it. It wanted to just be an A and a B. This is two places to go when you're moving up. And again, and you're in those spaces now, and you're moving through these various stairs, and we have multiple ways of getting from place to place. And it's really used that way, because the scene really is, a, is, a, is an urban place. And um, like an urban place, there's, um, you have choices. And then looking out of the upper, the eighth floor, um, secondary lobbies, looking down at the, um, the foundation building and the park, and again, um, from that position. Terrific. Thank you so much. I was told you were going to ask lots of questions, or some questions. Oh, you know I forgot to read? Guy, it's on it. You could, I'm on a plane, right? A barf bag. Uh, I remember the uh, early discussion of relationships. And um, I'm reading a, um, Jerome Rifkin's book on empathy. Interesting, I don't know if he writes a lot of books. It's his 16th book. Um, and I thought this is really beautiful. And, I don't know, Leb, you and I have had this conversation about optimism, pessimism, and um, I'm going to quote. He says, um, and a little part of this thing, that I was reading on the plane on the way from, from Paris, um, we are by nature a, um, an affectionate species that continuously seems to broaden and deepen our relationships and our connections with others. And I was realizing, um, I believe that actually. And I think that makes me an optimist. <laughs> and he's attacking um, the pure Darwinists, and he's absolutely attacking Freud. Freud, of course, is odd, because he was still a First Testament guy. And uh, it's a fascinating book. But I, I think and it goes back to um, if one believes that um, empathy is the foundation of the human character that differentiates us from, hmm, not all animals, but clearly we, we have an extended amount of empathy from a cat or a dog or a porpoise or a sea lion or whatever. Although, mm, my little puppy has more, more empathy than some people I know. But um, uh, anyway, if you believe that, it, it goes back to the discussion that architecture is finally um, about a dialogue and about a conversation. And that I'm particularly interested in that at this exact moment of time, because I would have said um, in this country, as I speak, what's at risk at the moment is a conversation politically. What's being attacked by the extreme right is the dialogue. And it's extremely, extremely dangerous that we're, our society is based on dialogue and conversation and difference. And uh, I'm fascinated with that notion of relationships and differentiation. A relationship takes place with a um, even a somewhat radical differentiation, which that I would say would be a reasonably good start in defining our particular culture and the, um, the invention of what we call the US of A um, as it emerged uh, from a world that was still located within um, nations and was located et within ethnic, within tribal structure, right? And um, there's a direct connection between this notion of empathy, differentiation, and conversation. I'm going to come up here as I get closer. Is that OK? Are you going to give it to him? Everybody can hear. Can you hear me? Uh, we won't be able to hear on the recording. They took your mic. <laughs> it must be. Okay. Is there another mic over there? Yeah. Okay. 
No, yes. you, you, you invoke my name, so I will simply respond in terms of your, yes, you are optimistic, and your idea of empathy as a ruling force in society is uh, very beautiful, but also very uh, wishful. Because what we see going on, let's just call it the forces of unfettered free market capitalism, all right? And it's interesting that you have cooperated very little with that aspect uh, in your architecture, with that segment of society. Your work isn't for developers and free marketeers. You're, you're working for institutions which, by their very nature, education or uh, government, federal government, courts, which by their very nature, uh, at their very roots, are empathetic. But unfortunately, most of the world today being built is not built any longer by government because government's privatizing. They're getting out of the uh, society business and so on and so on. I won't bang on about it. But, but so, yeah, I am much more pessimistic. Uh, you've managed to build uh, wonderful buildings for the most empathetic aspects or, or uh, institutions. How, how do you react to that? I mean, uh, are you going to work for more developers now, or have you run out of institutional clients you can work for? What's going to happen? No, I don't think. Uh, well, first of all, you know we don't we don't control that. We control it to some degree. You can choose not to work on, on certain commissions, which of course has been part of my world. Um, I'm not sure it, it depends on whether it's private or public. I think it has to do with the nature of that institution and the client and whether there's an alignment. And that's always a loaded, loaded subject because if you only look at alignment in a very strict way, you, you, you would never build. <laughs> you might never have a piece of work. Um, that's a complicated one. And we all um, choose our course of action. But I think it, it's, if, if it's implying um, I think it's dangerous to imply a high-mindedness, and I won't take that position. I have many of my colleagues that do work, and maybe the people I wouldn't want to work for, but the world, all of us have to make those choices, and I'm not going to, I don't want to go there. Um, um, no, I, your, your broader question, the, the optimist-pessimist, you could agree with empathy and be quite a pessimist. I'm not claiming that it. I'm just, just curious. I just read it, and I just literally been rattling it around, and I, and and it's something that a lot of us have chatted about, and and um, it is at my core. I am somewhat optimistic within a pessimistic framework, let's say, <laughs> a realistic framework, because um, in fact, I find working with students very complicated sometimes because I'm very brutal in my critique and maybe. Um, um, just about ruthless sometimes. But then once you've established that, okay, we agree, this is how the world exhibits, this is the world we inhabit, now I go to work and work with that world and, and try to change it. But the notion of, um, I don't know, of course there's both sides. We're a murderous, vicious species. But I have to... You have a choice. Uh, finally, I'm reading this, and I'm, I mean, the Darwin thing is kind of stupid. It's, that's been going on for a long time, and Freud, that's old news. Um, but finally, well, look who we, look who we voted for president. I, I can find good news. Uh, how many culture? I just came from Paris, and they're still, they're still rattling it around. They can't deal with it. We really, can I use the word fuck here? We really fucked them up. Because they, they have, they're very high-minded in terms of their notion of the republic and democracy, et cetera. And they, no way in hell could this happen in France, right? And they know it. And they're really struggling with it right now. Everybody's still talking about it. It's just absolutely, it's so much fun to be, a, after all these years, it's actually great to travel. I mean, I, I suffered through eight years of just ab horrible, horrible critique and you, where you have to go, okay, okay, I'm an American, but you know we have like a democratic system and there's a left, there's a left and a right, right? And... Um, and through people that, that, that should have been, uh, well, okay, I won't go into that. But, um, and so it's, it, I'm actually, uh, for 
since quite a few many years, I'm very proud of being part of this country, which is lovely. And uh, so I'm, I don't know. I think you can find optimism and pessimism where you want to find it, right? And um, we, we seem to have leadership right now that is loaded with intelligence. And by the way, um, massive empathy, I would say. Wouldn't you characterize a lot of our leaders at the moment of being on the empathetic side of the equation? Empathy meaning um, a realism of an attitude towards your fellow human character and, and an, uh, an acknowledgement of our inequities and the, the inherence of those inequities, right? And how else can you proceed in life? Well, then you just put a gun to your head at some point. I mean, <laughs> what does, no? See, I don't believe it. I think you also are, you're complicated. You, all of us are, have multiple aspects of our personalities, right? You, you couldn't invent things without optimism. Isn't invention itself? Um, isn't, listen, if you forget the, 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 the aspect of empathy, aren't we all explorers and innovators by nature, I think? Isn't the human character? We climb mountains and we, 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 we kind of constantly innovate and explore, and, right? And we explore intellectually and explore psychologically. We explore through our activities, no? I would have said it's part of the human character and our synaptic stuff seems to operate considerably different. Well, the fact that we're conscious probably helps a lot, right? That we recognize our own deaths, and blah, blah, blah. By the way, do you think it, you get more empathetic as you get older? Meaning you, you approach your own shelf life? I would say the answer, especially for men, would be yes. How about your school? Yeah. You don't have the answer for the school? Or for <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, I don't uh, see too much of Buckminster Fuller in your work. Uh, on the outside of the buildings, it's very sharp and pointed and doesn't give a feeling of fluidity. It doesn't give a feeling of solidity. No, fluidity. Flow. F L O W. Got it. Uh, uh, is there a reason for that? Huh. <laughs> no, not, not at all. You know, um, I, I don't spend much time uh, thinking about the, 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 the result of the. Hmm, anything adjectival describing the thing? And I'm kind of disinterested in it, actually. Once I've done it, it's, just, it's over and I'm off something else. And, uh, I have a very ambivalent attitude, even towards aesthetics. I get involved in a process, and it just produces something, and I'm not even sure where I stand. It makes it difficult to talk about a lot of times. I'm not even interested in talking about it, because I have no clue myself what it means, other than what I try to talk about. <laughs> I work around it. But I'm so in embedded in the th making of the thing that I have no real, uh, I have no grasp of, of how to define it. And I don't even see that as my job. That's somebody else's job. That's the public or the writer or a critic. Or My job is to make stuff, right? And you can't make stuff. And you can critique it, but the critique is much more complicated. It's not critiquing it as a, as a thing in society that it, it's a good or bad or it's, it's beautiful or not. And I have no interest in beauty. I don't believe in it. Um, I'm interested in things that are provocative and um, that provoke thinking. And, and it could be on a huge range of emotional level. Like the, the traditional notion of beauty to me is really horribly limited for an architect if it has to be operate under some authority of beauty. It, it's impossible to kind of invent something if you're, if you're burdened with that. Luckily, everything is moving now. And again, this, the, the world has shifted so radically in the last couple decades in terms of what architecture is or isn't. And there's also, not counting the historical, the, the demand for uh, a prevalence of history, the public, I think, is fairly open. That's a complicated discussion, but there, there isn't really a, there isn't a singular idea what architecture is or isn't, other than defaulting to history, and then that's pretty powerful, especially in this country. You know there's just about zero architectural output in this place. You guys are aware of that? Nothing. Scary in terms of work, frightening. Everybody, architects from all over the world, ask you, "Huh, 
what's cooking in the U.S.? How come we don't see, where is it? You educate everybody. Literally everybody that comes out of, you can name the top 15 schools here. And I can go any place in the world. I can hang out in Shanghai. When I go to Shanghai, and I'm talking to a group of guys, and we got 15 of us together. They rattle off the schools. They read Paul Osser. They've seen the latest films. They, 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 it's just amazing. You can write, and they're, they're completely connected. But they got great work. They have people that are pushing them to innovate. The, the piece that came out in Shanghai over the water is, is 50 meters. It's 150 feet. Um, I had a project that was a little similar to that over an old historic building in Chicago. I lost the building in three seconds. They saw that piece. And I actually came in prepared and talked about it, that there were um, 80 bridges in New York that are 100 feet long that move, built at the turn of the century. And it freaked them out. There's a huge conservative kind of attitude right now towards buildings. Hope you can get beyond that. That's such a great opportunity in the city. And a school, I mean, especially a new school, a new, new school, whatever, huge opportunity. And again, I mentioned the kind of specificity. It seems like um, the little I know about this place that it is, you could claim a, a uniqueness to this institution, differentiated from other institutions. Am I right? I mean, Cooper was fantastic. We were talking a minute ago, but it's such an idiosyncratic. Cooper is an eccentric <laughs> place. Everybody knows Cooper. I knew Cooper as a, as a kid. It was very much the part of the formation of SciArc. We were looking at Cooper and we were looking at the AA. And um, we had a very clear idea what Cooper was, what its uh, mission was, and how it operated, and a certain type of freedom it had uh, artistically to explore ideas that couldn't happen in larger institutions that were connected to universities, let's say, that are a little more complicated, right? Like, like larger corporations within the private sector. You, you start losing flexibility. And in, I think in the artistic realm or the creative realm, what you always need is massive um, flexibility. You need malleability, right? You need the, the, the removal of, of constraints is the absolute first thing you need, right? And then, um, again, you have, we did, and hopefully we, we did some of it correctly, um, it becomes didactic. You can express the, that openness, right? And um, again, I, I mentioned earlier the discussion of, it seems like architects in this country have been posed as you're kind of radical on one side if you're interested in changing things. And it's a really unfortunate conversation because it should be, um, I mean, I'm a Midwest guy. I'm the most conservative guy in the world. And I don't even vaguely see what we're doing as radical. Um, it's just thinking freely just working your way through a problem and letting that take you someplace and removing as many constraints as possible. Because my whole life really has been trying to remove the constraints, not trying to tip something upside down, but trying to remove the, the, the constraints that don't allow me to think freely or to pursue those ideas in, in your work. And I think in this country, it's one of the most unfree places, really, to finally to realize work not to conceive, to conceive them with an intellectual sense, a conceptual sense, because I, I think that our, that our schools are still probably the best schools in the world. It's, again, we're, right? everybody comes here. But the next environment is really tough. But again, you got, here you're, you're just starting, so you get this great opportunity to really produce something and to, um, that demonstrates kind of who you are. By the way, that's another thing. Um, wouldn't it make sense that schools that are nurturing uh, inquisitiveness would be at the forefront of really pushing architecture until it breaks. You'd be better off to make a mistake than to build something that doesn't even attempt to do anything. Mistakes are fantastic. I mean, nobody grows without making errors, right? But to take no risks, oh, I would say the, the institution is not even doing its job, right? The first thing I would ask, what's at stake? If you can't say what's at stake, yawn. <laughs> not, okay, who cares? Just build a generic building and don't even worry about it. Just say it architecture is not something that you're interested in. Or it doesn't somehow participate in your educational environment. And um, that's kind of a rat. That's kind of difficult to say, though. It probably does. Make sense? You want to you decide what you're about and determine that and, 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 and um, state it.
that um, your kind of work could, uh, that a New York architect could never produce the kind of work you do. That in New York we talk too much and we critique too much, but in Los Angeles there's this, you know how Peter Cook loves Los Angeles, everything's great in LA, that there's not a conversation out there. And actually, we find the same thing with the Arctic's newspaper, that we have a very difficult time finding people to take on difficult topics out there. Whereas in New York, we have no end of people that want to talk about architecture. Um, so I'm just wondering how you feel that your work, of, 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 I mean, I know you had a conversation with all of your contemporaries and people who founded SARC, and there's some great you know, people there. But as a kind of public space, New York has it really has this conversation. You talked about meeting the people from the Ukrainian church and the neighborhood and the East neighbors in the East Village, um, and how that really plays into your architecture and whether you feel like th there is a kind of discussion about architecture in, in Los Angeles. I mean, I mean, we hear this all the time from architects that they build something and then nobody talks about it. It just kind of disappears. That's from LA architects, and in New York. It's like too much, you know, the leave me alone. I, I don't want to hear, you know, another critique of your building. So I'm just curious about this idea about conversation because you talked about being provocative. And I'm wondering if, if architects in Los Angeles need to be provocative because there's no dialogue, whether you need to Gee, really promote, to get it, that out there. Yes, several questions. The, um, the dialogue, um, certainly during my formation as an architect, mm -hmm. um, late, middle, late 70s, 80s, yeah. the dialogue in L.A. was absolutely monstrous. Between who? who Huge. Was, where Between, was it coming from? Other architects? Uh, primarily two learning academies, UCLA and SARC. Okay. Yeah. Um, huge number of people visiting the city and certain very unusual people that needed to be given, and someday they'll get their credit, that weren't the ones that went off and built, the Coy Howards and the Robert Mangurians right. and okay. the Craig Hodges, etc. Um, the focus was on um, the work. Yeah. And I would have said in New York at the same time, and I've been coming here my whole life and spent a lot of time teaching in Columbia, et cetera, um, more politicized. And uh, I would have bad? said at that times bad, less, a bad thing or? less um, or focused. Yeah. Hard to separate from the amb personal ambition sometimes. And, LA, I, I have to say, I look back in an immensely collegial place. Uh -huh. We got along, and we were talking earlier, one person's gain wasn't another person's loss. And, um, but amazing conversations, I have to say. Uh -huh. And um, a lot of people were coming in out of town at that time. The Archogram boys, the, the Isasaki, Jenks was organizing this and that, on and on. I mean, it, was, it was huge. And, um, I don't know. I would, have, I would have said it had been very, very important. The, the, dis the other discussion, the, 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 the Cooper Union with the community, I started as an urban designer, so I'm, I was going back to something I'd, I'd done years ago. Um, to me, I, I'm going to move that a little bit. I would have said the conversation has more to do with the connection of a, a, a strategy and a, a somewhat malleable strategy and the requirements of architecture today, which is um, kind of ever-changing in its demands. Um, Cincinnati was the opportunity for me. And then we had this extremely um, open strategic position of the, the multiple systems. So the, the project could continually change and we're not using, well, certainly the, 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 the fixed class, classical systems of symmetries and biaxiality and all that, but that would be the extreme. But we have something that's, that's malleable, which is um, uh, in alignment with the reality of the dynamics of program today. And that um, the Cooper's ditto, that we're not, um, we're not struggling with preconceived notions of, of um, proportions or, or, or organizational attitudes, right? That they're, they're extremely open and they're, they're just about, in some cases, irrelevant. I can change things and it's, there's, there's no, hmm. it's a complex decision whether they're pluses and minuses to, to, the, ar to the, ar the architecture. And I think that, um, to me, it'd be a broad discussion about the, your, the relationship of the formation of your work and its alignment to the realities of, of practice today. Do you see any interesting architecture coming out of New York now? Um, in what sense? 
Uh, well, in the, in the sense that, you know, the, the kind of dynamism of your building, I mean, I think it really seemed to, to most New Yorkers like it probably couldn't happen from a New York architect. There was some kind of Gee, I had to say, I think that's an immense compliment. Huh? <laughs> Just, <laughs> <laughs> the blowing it all open that maybe, and th that could have only happened by somebody coming in from the outside. Maybe you know, we talk too much about architecture. Let me, let me ask you then. I would have said, it, I, I don't know the answer, but if I had to take a hunch that um, this is the center of commerce in the world in a time of hyper-capitalism. I can't imagine it wrapping up too much. It looks like it's, they're, they're gonna put the brakes on it at some point, right? Based on this last thermostica. But um, I have to say that the, the influence of commerce here and the roots of power would have to affect an architect here. In a bad and of way, course, you're saying in a bad way. Not in just a bad way, it would, it would eliminate your the freedom necessary to explore. Yeah. And that um, the huge loss of opportunities. There's also another factor that, that everybody's talked about, that the scale of the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked to Stephen Hall for my whole life. Um, you start with a shop, and then the next one is a, a 60-story tower. And Los Angeles, like Tokyo, like Mexico City, is a, is a scale as a scale of a city where as a younger architect, you can find middle-sized commissions and there's a there's a set of opportunities that are present based on the the um, the typology in the city and the scale of the city that have been I think more useful for young architects. Uh, but as you hit 45 or 50 mm -hmm. cliff, then there's nothing. Well, we hear the exact nothing. opposite. The young architects in LA tell us all they get to do is houses and they don't can't move up in scale. That's right. Yeah, no, I'm saying yeah, and they get in the shops and the, the, the cafes, and then the next level it's a cliff. Yeah. You go out of the country. You 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 have to literally go out of the country. But in L.A., but in New York, what happens when you get the tower? Is, there, are you, is it even an architectural project in the city? Yeah. I don't know. Look at, uh, they've, they've, Charlie's at Astor Place has been completely stomped on. But that's Steve Ross. Yeah. You know Steve Ross? Uh -huh. Yeah. Then you know, you know the situation. Right. He's going to own you. And he'll tell you he owns you. Right. All right? Well, that was Levius's point, I guess, that you... Have chosen not to work for Steve Ross, but these kind of institutional clients. Yeah, it's you, possible easy. you could make that choice. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I guess it's but hard because for money. This is a city that's owned, that's owned by, and it's they're not shy about it. Yeah, that you you know. But it, but on the other hand, there seem to be here. You are building building, and there seem to be all kinds of. This is a city that's rich with with institutions. Well, we do have the High Line for better or worse and all the stuff that's happening around Absolutely. the High Line. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why doesn't that happen? I, I don't know. We just, again, we just took the project and it, it just proceeded with it. I didn't see it as anything extraordinary. We were just asking questions and producing a piece of work. Hi, Tom. Sorry for a very mundane question. Um, I, I really appreciate your building as what it gives to New York. Um, I guess my question is about uh, what it does to Cooper. Um, I think uh, you said at University of Cincinnati there was a, a turn towards architecture to bring back the campus and um, not spend it on professorships but on architecture. And at Cooper, I always had a sense that it was the endowment that um, allows the students to go there tuition-free that um, was the architecture of Cooper. And uh, so my mundane question is life cycle. Um, in a building that is trying to um, push the limits of difference and environmental technologies and movable parts um, next to a 150-year-old building, that has maintained the endowment. Um, I guess this is a custodial point of view, a life cycle point of view. How do you see your building in 150 years? Uh, you know, I didn't mention and the two very obvious things. Um, the building is a, a platinum building, first in New York. And um, we built it for $625 a square foot. 
to give you a reference point, Tsushima down the street, the, the museum, was 1,000 two years earlier by the same contractor. So it was an extremely, extremely austere building. Right? It's rough, right? And in the end, uh, I remember walking through with Jeff Kipnis, and, and he looked at me and he said, uh, Tom, it's really lucky you don't get big budgets. It's going to kill you. And it, I was so frustrated in certain aspects of that that I wanted definitely kind of ramped up a bit. And um, I thought about that, and I think he's actually correct. Um, the, uh, the, the roughness actually made it kind of fit the community, right? And it came from the, the reality of the force of the economics. And um, um, yeah, that was, I don't know that what the was dollar, actually, I don't know, I get you, yeah. I don't know what no, the that dollar was my value first is, impression. but the delta in energy of that building again, because we spent a huge amount of time. Sorkin, how are you? <laughs> Just, I didn't see you there. The, um, it's going to be a, a significant delta. In, in San Francisco, the delta was so large that they could hire a full-time person to do nothing but, like, with a screwdriver, kind of tighten things up, and right? And, uh, and they had another million dollars left a year. And so uh, we're in the same situation here, that if you develop a, a highly efficient building, that it's, um, it is a life cycle. That's what you're doing, right? And uh, the movable parts were done with. That's the last. <laughs> it's just we'll, we're moving on to a different, a different direction at that level. They probably won't even use them that much. They don't need them. It was the like end of a, a, the fifth building we'd worked on. It. And it, it had to do with pragmatics. We thought people wanted to see out directly, and they don't care. It's irrelevant. We couldn't do that for a private, a private practice. It wouldn't work for an office building or blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's not true. The one in Paris where, where you're doing that. It's okay. And 150 years from now, was it? How do what? you see your building? 150 years from now? How do what? Next to a 150-year-old building. How, how do well, well, first, I, I just really, the, the inexpensive building, I really appreciate it. In fact, I, when I first saw the building, I said, God, this is if Frank Gehry never had a big budget. He probably would have done something as good. So, um, you know, I think that's obvious and commendable. But the, the, the question is, 150 years from now, I mean, what's, what's the state of your building? And what, I mean, again, I, I loved how you talked about it next to a 150-year-old building. That was the most innovative of the town. In 150 years now, in um, 30 years from now, the mechanical systems will be obsolete and they'll be replaced. Right? And it's very possibly including the skin. I'm probably not the skin of stainless steel. It's, it's worth a couple hundred years. But um, the mechanics, are, it's like an automobile. You, it's, they're going to be, they're, they're differentiated. And you don't look at an automobile and look at the battery, the tires, the brake system, et cetera, as singularly. They, they, are, they, they have their own shelf life, and so does a building. Right? And uh, certainly, if, if there's any trajectory in the, in the last um, 50, you can anticipate that certainly the mechanics are going to change radically. Yeah? Hi. First of all, I just want to uh, thank you very much for this um, very enlightening uh, you know, lecture that you've given us. Um, I'm, I'm actually approaching uh, this lecture from a point of view of uh, complex problems. And I'm, I'm on a search for processes um, that can be applied to other problems. And I, I've, I've really, uh, listening to you, is, I'm very excited um, because I think you're on to a process that can be applied in some of the areas that I'm interested in. So I'd just like to um, possibly, it may be very simple, maybe you've already written a book about it, but I'd like to know more about these, this process that you apply um, at the beginning of each of your buildings. Um, and if you could just touch on, explain that a little bit more, possibly point me in the direction of where I can read about this more, um, because I'm really interested in that you obviously have a process, a uh, pretty well-refined process at approaching each of these different buildings that, that produce an output, and I think that can be applied in other areas that I'm interested in. So, thank you. If that makes sense. Well, that's a... Um I'll, I'll just touch on it, but that's not, it's it possible. It's, it's, a very, it's a complicated issue, and it, yeah. it's not answerable, actually. Um, I think, it, 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 very simply, it, it starts um, not with a formal premise. I have no interest in language, that I, a continuity of language, right? And clearly, there's preferences, and there's, um, I see them as limitations. There's just this stuff that comes out of your hand, which is, which is um, repetitive. And, um, and then that translates into a, a culture of an office that's repetitive. In fact, it becomes one of the biggest problems in a culture, 
because it starts that rep repetition starts ending a certain type of innovation, and that's why you need to continually shift your office. Corbu did it every th th three years or whatever, and it's, it's completely understandable. Um, but I think it starts with the broad questions of how does architecture even participate with the problem? I think it has to start with that, right? Not with, it, it doesn't start with, with uh, a formal discussion. It starts with the, the nature of the problem that you're confronting and um, um, locating the, the, um, the architectural urban component of that problem. And it's going to take you very, very different places. We're doing a, a TGV station in, um, in Vigo, Spain, right now. Um, it's 500 meters long, and um, it has very, very particular parameters having to do with the, the notion of the functionality of a, of a high-speed rail. Um, and it has a very particular site overlooking a bay, et cetera, et cetera. And as we discuss the problems, they're, um, they shift more macro or broader urban in scope. Right, and it starts with broad, broad issues that are either infrastructural or urban, um, and it's going to lead you to an architecture. And um, if we're um, the far tower had to do with the kind of radical eccentricity of a site, so it immediately was is dealing with the, the this non-site condition, which was immediately tectonic, structural, programmatic, uh, movement, infrastructural, etc. And it, it takes you someplace. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But I think as, as you start each project, it, it starts with a, um, uh, an articulation of the um, the elements that are open for um, hmm, that make up the fabric, right, of this conversation. That are going to make up the fabric of the of the the, 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 the genetic material of the work itself, and that um, and it's it's based on dialogue. I've got a group of people around me. It's not singular. I, I don't. Sit in, it's not a sketch. Mm. I'm a cusp guy, so it could at times, but it doesn't matter. It'll be attacked immediately, meaning only that I've synthesized quickly those areas into some diagram. But it's but it starts with a conversation, and it starts with a conversation which is collective, and that includes, by the way, um, at some point, very early on, it includes client, user, city, etc. And more and more, as the work increases the scale, of course, the, the, the client becomes larger, collective, more complicated, et cetera. And um, today, I think that that's really, really complicated, that you have to have, again, a system that's open enough that includes from the get-go the, um, the desires of the client. But at that point, there has to be an articulation of, of the, uh, the limits of that conversation. They're not now formal, for sure. They have to do with the, the, the direction of the project in terms of the desires within performance or functional terms. I'm one more. I'm really exhausted. What I need is a. I actually martini. wanted to help a, a, a you martini. and to thank you for the lecture <laughs> and invite you to do the same. <laughs>